One of the wonderful sourcing, tracing, and integrating aspects of carbon isotopes is its capacity to allow us to look at ecosystem scale patterns. Whether we're looking at ecosystem scale processes through measurements in the atmosphere, in soils, or nowadays as we're increasingly interested in climate change. The carbon isotope ratio of the atmosphere, as I mentioned earlier, is changing. It's gone from about 7.5 in 1980 to about 8.5 today. Over a short time period, there's not a change, but there is a big change over time. The changes we see in the represented in black represent the instantaneous values measured, and they reflect the balance of photosynthesis, which fractionates, and decomposition, which does not fractionate. So we see variations in the 13 C of the atmosphere over the course of 12 months, reflecting these two different processes. But over a period of days or so, we tend not to see changes. And so we can begin to use the atmosphere as a way to help us understand the processes that are taking place here within the canopy. That is, we can use the boundary layer of air as a cuvette Dave Keeling, probably 50 or 60 years ago, showed that you could make measurements of CO2 within canopies of the free air, and that because the air was relatively stable, the buildup of CO2 was associated with respiration, whether it was respiration coming out of the soil, coming out of the bowls, or coming out of the needles. When he measured the CO2 concentration and isotope ratio over time, and plotted it as a function of the CO2 uh, carbon isotope ratio and the inverse of CO2 concentration, he found a linear relationship with the intercept being the flux-weighted integrated value of respiration. Remembering from before, that might be analogous to the isotope ratio of the leaf, which would then allow us to work backwards to figure out what the long-term CICA ratio was, because the, bound, the air and, uh, outside the boundary layer is going to be relatively constant over a period of hours or days. This Keeling plot observation has allowed lots of ecosystem scale measurements, and one of the first people to capitalize on this was Chuntal Lai. And Chuntal Lai set up a series of sampling systems and different ecosystems across the United States. So we could look at C4 grasslands and C3 forests and plot the relationship between CO2 and inverse and uh, carbon isotope or CO2 by collecting flasks and analyzing, analyzing <clears throat> them back in the laboratory. This is a foundation that has now become much more common in NEON, where all NEON sites and most Ameriflux sites have a system like this to measure the isotope ratio of ecosystem respiration. We've seen this graph before, or this relationship before, where the CICA ratio reflects the balance of supply, somatoconductance, conductance, and photosynthesis, and that carbon is fixed. What you might not realize is that a lot of the CO2, which is fixed over the course of the day, is respired within the next 24 to 48 hours. Although a fraction is coming from decomposition, a significant fraction is coming from fuller respiration. So we can measure the 13C of respired CO2 and learn something about how the CICA ratio has changed within that ecosystem. One of the first observations was made along a precipitation gradient in Oregon from the coast to the interior. It's known as Otter or the Oregon uh, transect. That work was done by Barbara Bond, Bev Law, Nate McDowell, and Dave Bowling. When they collected needles of different vegetation types from the wet coastal regions to the dry interior, they saw that the CO2 isotope ratio changed, just as we'd seen in the George Stewart example uh, shown earlier. But what they also found was that the isotope ratio of ecosystem respiration changed in a similar pattern. 
so that the isotope ratio of respiration tended to be more negative in the wetter high CI regions and higher in the drier low CI CA regions, but that there was a lot of variation. And the question was, what's driving this variation? It turns out that it's vapor pressure deficit, that over a period of a couple of days, stomates will open and close depending on the humidity in the air. And as the stomates opened and closed, that changed the carbon isotope ratio of ecosystem respiration. So ecosystems tend to be very dynamic, having short-term responses with respect to VPD and long-term responses with respect to soil water deficit. This precipitation impact can also be measured in the CO2 fluxes in rainforests, <coughs> where Yoko Ishida and Jao Meadow from Brazil measured the isotope ratio of ecosystem respiration on a monthly basis in Santarém, in the middle of the tropical rainforest of Brazil, and saw that as the seasonal or monthly precipitation changed, there were big changes in the isotope ratio of ecosystem respiration. Now turning to soils, Nina Buchmann showed that if you began to sample the isotope ratio of leaves, fresh litter, old litter, organic matter in the uh, surface layers and in deeper layers, that there was a progressive increase in carbon isotope ratio. That progressive increase was seen in Pinus contorta stands, in Populus tremuloide sands, stands, and in Acer sands. In each case, as the soil got older and older, the carbon isotope ratio of organic matter was increased. So something was happening. The soils, the vegetation, the uh, organic matter was going from being relatively depleted in carbon-13 to relatively enriched. So Nina began to explore this further, and now we understand more about the processes. If you look at the carbon isotope ratio of organic matter in the soil, and this could be analysis to, lit to litter, to at the deeper measure, uh, deeper depths, you see a progressive enrichment. That's because plant decomposition decomposes organic matter, releasing CO2 with some organic matter PP re remaining. Microbials and insect synthesis within the soil takes that decomposed plant material and produces new material. Some of those reactions involve a carboxylation. Because 13 CO2 diffuses away more slowly than does 12 CO2. The CO2 that gets incorporated into this new microbial biomass is going to be 13C enriched. And as we continue this cycle of plant decomposition, microbial synthesis, microbial decomposition, and an increase in recalcitrant soil organic matter, what we're going to see is because of the carboxylations, progressive increase in 13C values within the soil. Now we can begin to look at the fluxes coming out of the soil using the same Keeling plot approach, putting a chamber over the soil and measure the change in CO2 concentration and the isotope ratio of that CO2. And Larry Flanagan was among the first to show that the isotope ratio coming out of the soil here, minus 22.7, 22.8, was a reflection of the material being decomposed in this black spruce forest in Canada. So here we have a valuable tool that we can begin to use. Larry began to apply this now to look at agricultural lands. Imagine in uh, Alberta, that you have a C3 uh, grassland which remains fallow. And if you measure the isotope ratio of the CO2 fluxing out over time, it doesn't change. But what if you take that C3 soil and you now plant corn, a C4 plant? What you'll find then is that the isotope ratio increases very quickly during the course of the season. So that we go from a 
depleted soil ecosystem respiration to an enriched. So if we take a C4 and allow it to stay fallow, we see more or less constant value over time. If we now take that C4 soil and we now add new corn, growing corn on the soil, we see it comes up to the value here as we had, saw when a C3 site uh, now had corn. This reflects the fact that we have recalcitrant CO2, uh, rec recalcitrant SOM being metabolized, whether we're looking at a C3 or a C4 landscape, but that the isotope ratio of the current metabolism tends to dominate, and that reflects the, the C4 crop, in this case corn, on the site. Over time, Chris Neal and his colleagues in Brazil have shown that as you take uh, and uh, deforest a region and begin to look at the isotope ratio of the respiration, that progressively over time, for these three, three different grassland sites, the isotope ratio with, of the organic matter in the soil now tends to reflect the C4 landscape from the original C3 landscape. So there's a time-dependent change as the organic matter is slowly turning over, the C3 is slowly turning over, and the C4 signal begins to dominate in the organic matter. So lastly, let's, con let's consider how plants are responding to climate change. We can go back to the model we showed earlier of a supply function, that is, the leaf conductance and a demand function that is photosynthesis with the balance point being the operational or metabolic set point and that's going to be related to intrinsic water use efficiency as, we, as we've shown as measured by CICA and carbon isotope ratio. Lots of people in forestry have become interested in the last decade in measuring changes in, in intrinsic water use efficiency and try to understand what is driving that variation? I'm just going to show you two quickly, two studies, one from the Ameriflux studies, uh, Ameriflux sites here. And you, you see is that across all the sites, the intrinsic water use efficiency has been increasing over the last 30 to 40 years. Lots of differences among ecosystems, uh, forest types, but there's a general increase in water use efficiency. And the question is, what's driving this? Is it change in CO2 concentration? Is it a change in precipitation? Is it a change in temperature? Or is it a change in vapor pressure deficit? Or is it some combination of all these parameters that is making the vegetation more intrinsically water use efficient uh, than it was before? Here's another study which has looked at that by uh, uh, Samaya Bellamichari, and they are suggesting that looking at forest stands in the Pacific, I mean, sorry, in the eastern seaboard, uh, basically from Massachusetts to Maine, that we've seen the same intrinsic increase and in, in, uh, same increase in intrinsic water use efficiency, and trying to uh, understand the relationship between precipitation and CO2 is driving those changes. Avery Driscoll has taken a different perspective, and that is not to look at tree rings, but to look at leaves. Leaves of plants that were collected every single year on this drought deciduous shrub in Celia Farinosa. And she has 30 plus years of observations from the same plants over time. In the Mojave Desert, two sites in the Mojave Desert, the climate data tell us it's getting hotter, it's getting drier, less precipitation, and it's getting less humid. That is, vapor pressure deficit is increasing. She's looked at three different shrubs, Encelia farinosa, common on slopes, and Encelia frutescens and Ambrosia salsola, common in wash habitats. And all three shrubs are showing the same pattern. How do they get the data? Every year for the last 40 years, Folks from the Elbringer lab have gone out to the desert to escape the cold winter in Salt Lake City 
and to enjoy the desert and along the way to sample populations of these different shrub species. What she has observed, Avery has observed, is that the intrinsic water use efficiency <clears throat> in the shrub in Celia fernosa has increased over time <clears throat> as a result of a decrease in CICA. The same pattern occurs in Encelia frutescens and in the ambrosia. The data are simply not provided here. So what's driving this increase in intrinsic water use efficiency? What she finds is that whether you're looking at the Death Valley population or the Oatman population, that there are strong correlations with temperature, precipitation, and VPD. Of course, what's happening is that as it gets drier, the environment warms up more. There's only a fixed amount of moisture in the air. And so the major driver appears to be a change in vapor pressure deficit. The question right now is, are these plastic responses among the plants that are remaining there, or are there genetic changes taking place so that the population is turning over and we're seeing more intrinsically water use efficient plants replacing plants that were less water use efficient? Only time will tell. This is an exciting time in isotope ecology. If you remember the nine guidelines I've presented, 13C observations will become more interpretable and patterns will be more predictable. Just remember though that as our understanding of theory improves, we might change our explanation. So our good isotope values are always going to be useful. We just might change the interpretation. And don't forget, 13C observations were collected long before you were born. Do not ignore the older literature. I've spent most of today highlighting the foundational literature not the hot literature of the last two or three years. Thank you.